we had a, kind of a, a special screening during TIFF at the Opera House that we actually shot it at. Uh, and I didn't think that that could be matched, but this was really a special night, as I said, having done Opera with Rodney here on the stage and you know, trying to find a way to use this incredible form and then showing it on this same theater to you. It's really um, very, it was really powerful. For me. And the sound system here is really good, so. Um, but over to you. <laughs> over to me. Um, I'm first of all, I will say that I also like the phrase, the phrase enchantment. Yeah. And um, I'm wondering what, if you consider that kind of the, the governing motif, if you will, of the film, or when that line kind of entered the fray for you in this uh, iteration of the uh, story. Well, I've been obsessed with this for a long time because it seems to me that the, the, we have the story from the Bible, but then there was this whole slew of like artists in the 19th century that really became quite um, like fascinated with Salome as a story. Uh, you know, most famously the painting by Gustave Moreau and uh, Flaubert, and then Wilde, Wilde Wild writes this really, really amazing piece of text, which is, I think, ultimately about a, you know, a, a sexuality that couldn't be expressed. Uh, and he's dealing with this idea of what happens when when desire is is, is repressed or when it's not allowed to find um, expression. So it, it, it uses language. But the language he's using uh, with Salome is just, it's, it's so over the top. It's just, it's just, it's crammed full of all of these incredible uh, descriptions and poetic evocations, which Strauss then gets very excited about, and it just piles on all this musical, um, an attempt to describe, describe. But when you describe to that detail, there's something which is quite manic about it, and crazed. And so, and maybe I, I also felt this kind of crazy enchantment with the story, right? Which has been at the root of something for me. Like, I made this opera between Exotica and Sweet Hereafter, which are two films that are dealing quite discreetly with this idea of abuse. But then I had this idea of the dance and, and this idea of how the violence works in this opera, and it's in the story and in, this, in, in the play. I just felt it was a chance to unleash something. And uh, I don't know, like it's, it's just, it's very, I, I feel like the, the text by Wilde is unleashing something which is so, which he doesn't do in any other uh, material that he, he's written where, he's, where he's, he's purposely using this language to, to talk about something that he can that can't be actually uh, attained. So that does lead to a certain madness. I mean, I guess it's also, you know, that's not true. There are other writings of his, I mean, obviously. I mean, there's a reference, when they're talking about the magical mirrors, it's obviously portrait of Dorian Gray as well, which, which is also about a certain narcissistic madness as well. Uh, this, I'm not a lecturer, right? There are, <laughs> <laughs> there are, there are, I'm sure there are people who can talk about also about much better than I can, but I, I just feel like uh, it's an, an incredible piece of I, I felt having remounted it so many times that I, I wanted to investigate it further. And I also felt that there was an issue where I did this production in the 90s, which was quite provocative at that point, but felt like it, it, it needed to be re examined. And because of the way opera budgets are now, you can't do a new production. It makes, and it is a successful production, so it makes sense to remount it, but it felt really odd to be out without looking at it closer. So the script allowed me to, to do that uh, and create this character where I feel like it's a whole chain of men, you know, talking about the story, right? Like it's like I said from the Bible, it's a, it's, it's a male story that all these 19th century writers are all men and then Strauss and then uh, Charles slash me, but not Charles, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, but still there I was kind of remounting it. So it, it felt like it, it, it was owed kind of a, a, a different perspective, like let Janine come and re-own that thing. Uh, and I thought that was, that was an interesting thing to explore. Well, in addition to that, there, for myself at least, it feels like there's a certain subversion of expectation, perhaps, of this being a, a 
compliment uh, to the author itself. Um, and we, we begin with a very uh, atmospheric scene, and then we kind of drill down into the mundane of this as well, and then it escalates into a different space. But um, really curious to hear about your approach to that um, narratively when you, you began this kind of deconstruction for a reexamination of it. And then uh, your conversations with Paul, your cinematographer, about how you would um, maybe demystify uh, some of that, uh, that space. And, uh, well, yeah, you're right. It, did, it starts off with this extremely layered image, like when she walks into that rehearsal hall and she's looking at a projection, which she's going to, you know, but then her, the way her shadow works and, uh, and it's layered over the, the image of the, the young woman who's representing her in this projection. Like there's so many layers and veils right there in that first image. And then, and then it sort of goes back into something which is more, uh, yeah, mundane, you know, like just a, a lot of narrative, I suppose, at that point. Um, but yeah, it's a balance, right? I mean, that's what I think is interesting about the feature of form is that you do think that you have an hour and a half to tell this story. You're not consumed with having to hook people right away because they're committed, hopefully, for that period of time that you're here as opposed to watching a TV show. It's funny, I, I had a comment, uh, this woman had said that, I'm glad you didn't kind of do the classic thing where you start off with the birthday party at the house and her best friend is excited about her going away to do this and then they're zooming all the way through and the friend is like doing her own investigation of Salome and I'm going, that sounds like a really great commercial approach and it didn't even occur to me. Like I didn't reject it, it just never, my mind doesn't work that way. But I was thinking, yeah, there is a there is another way to like any story. There's so many different ways to approach it, and this one, having been interpreted so many times, um, you know, through, by various artists, this is yeah. Strategy becomes really important, like strategy and, and how it has to be. It, there has to be something lush about it, and there has to be. You have to be drawn into the the decadence of the of the, the visual language. Like the music becomes quite. And the language, you know, there's this idea of, of decadence, right? Like, you know, what does that mean when things are like too much, or you know, they, they seem to be boiling over with uh, with over too much information? The um, you know, you you, you described uh, approaching this from a different perspective, and one of the kind of threads that I find fascinating with it is the kind of the um, the demystification, uh, the attempt to demystification of art in it. So we have like the podcast, we have the behind the scenes videos, we have the uh, offer of uh, a blog post in place of a director's statement. And um, where, where were some of those impulses? Where did those come from? Oh, that's just from working in opera. I mean, I mean, there's this, 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 you know, like you're always asked, you know, that's just opera. No, no, but it's like, you know, like there's this real, like how do you make it accessible to people, right? And, and I think that the, uh, I've done that. I mean, like there's all sorts of behind the scenes things and, and we do at CFC and they're online. And, uh, and that particular thing about making the head is um, from a royal opera. It's inspired by a royal um, uh, Covent Garden sort of like thing on, on making the head. So this this attempt to kind of get people engaged, um, which is yeah. I mean, I think I, I was trying to, I was trying to be realistic to how opera companies work. I mean, like in, in the hierarchies within them, and uh, how you know sometimes bad decisions are made. Uh, Certainly, by the administration of this, this software, like a pretty bad decisions made. But it's inspired by a, by a bad decision that was made by a, a, a theater company in Toronto recently, uh, like in the past few years. So, so people, even even diverse boards, can make bad decisions, right? Like it's like I think people react like well, we're human beings, so people make complex decisions. So, and there's lots of other um, issues at play. I won't tell the story specifically, but it's interesting to me that there are times when, when an artist might go into a room, a boardroom uh, like that, and expect to be protected, and you know that's not what happens necessarily, in, in very unexpected ways, like not not an obvious way sometimes. Either. So, uh, before we turn it over to the audience, I did want to ask about Amanda Seyfried as well, because yeah. uh, it's been a while since you've worked yes. with her, and uh, she seems to understand. I mean, this is a presumption, but it appears an innate understanding of the register you want to operate within, and the two of you kind of share a language or a register in terms of performance, and um, even before the film becomes more grandiose, um, there's a real musicality, like a, a 
has a few musicality to her performance as well. Uh, maybe you can speak a little to what, what draws you to her as a performer and, and your collaboration yeah. together. I mean, I was just, you know, when, when I worked on Chloe, she hadn't really broken out, she was about to. And uh, I, I was, you know, she came in for an audition, and I was just really, um, really struck by the, how accessible she seemed at one level. Like, there was something so, so uh, emotionally available, and yet very um, nuanced. And, and then, honestly, I, like when I saw the, the drop off, the series that she did, I don't know if you saw the drop off, but she was just extraordinary. Like, it was an amazing performance. And that's when, um, you know, I've been watching her work and we've been stayed in touch since Chloe. And we talked about doing something together at some point again. And this just felt like, okay, this is the right, this was the right project. And it is, um, like, there are, like, I was funny, I was doing a talk with Gabrielle Rose, and she's also giving me these performances in my films where she just, she, she brings something which I wasn't expecting, and it just elevates the material. And that happens so often with what Amanda does, like that scene where she stops the opera, or where she's, where she's trying to, you know, get this erotic thing happening on stage that is not happening, and like what she's doing to try and get that person to do that. And I don't know, like I, I, you write this stuff, but then when, when someone is able to seize it and really just take it to that other place, it's, it's so, um, you're so thankful, right? And uh, so I, I've been really blessed with a number of performances and people uh, that I've worked with, including, uh, yeah, um, you know, Judith Forrest is still here. Is she? Like, it was my Herodias uh, in one of the, uh, you know, there she is. Um, it's amazing to me that uh, you know, we were just in the lobby, we were talking about um, doing an upcoming production of Vienna, and I was talking about her, her role. And, and, and again, like you see these performances that just shift you somehow. And sometimes you, you're lucky enough to be able to work with these amazing, rare human beings that we have who, who can uh, have access to their inner life in a way that is really so phenomenal, right? Really genuinely, like, incredible. That, and especially when they're singing as well. Like that is an unworldly thing. That's the hardest thing to actually get through when you're making an opera film, is, is the power of it is the live voice, right? So how do you, you know, there's that moment where she's directing uh, 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 Frederic uh, Aoun, uh, who's playing uh, Nerval, and you, you just have him sing that line, and you see her, reacting to it, but it's, you're still hearing it as a recording though, no matter how well recorded it is, so you don't have the vulnerability of what the live human voice is doing. Um, anyway, uh, thank you all for staying. Are there, are there... <laughs> uh, I'll turn it over to uh, with uh, one great and very nice. Yes, yes. This movie is going to sit with most of us for uh, a long time. Approach of, I'd say, kind of a uh, non linear narrative of what you were saying before of taking pieces and eventually them all coming together. Um, having your audience be on that journey is that uh, what leads to that, that thought provoking feeling or, or a reaction you have to Seth Bales or, or yeah. any other movie? Yeah, the question was about the, uh, you know, the different perspectives in the film. Is that kind of provocative nature what draws you to, to some of those? I mean, these films are structured like the, the, it's an emotional uh, response to the material. It's not that uh, there's ever a linear, sort of, and this is actually more linear than some of the other films, I would say, but it's like uh, this is how I feel the material. Now, the, the, the challenge here, honestly, was the placement of the voiceover. Right, so so like the balance of that because because I don't usually use voiceover text, but but, but this in this case it felt very uh, integral to to the telling of her story, and that 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 shifted things from the other films, like where where there's silence. There's a lot more um, people are speaking a lot more than they would have in some of the other films. So one of the audience members had uh, mentioned the Joster where it's like incredibly sparse, the dialogue. But here, you know, because she's a director, and she, she, she needs to explain in her strange way, right? I mean, 
she's 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 uh, you know the way she's drafting is, is very. Uh, we don't really know like what, what what level her direction is, right? Like as the podcaster says, we don't. We, you know, she she certainly you know uh, is is drawn to the material, but the way she's working with the performers is 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 not the normal way, right? Obviously, um, so there was a lot of different tones, and that was the trickiest thing: is balancing the tone and this. Spaces, right? Like where there's space between dialogue and um, you know the kind of the awkwardness of that. Like I'm always fascinated by that. Like those spaces, because because often we fill it up in an attempt to kind of make things fluid, but it's actually interesting for me when you don't and you just sort of see people resting with things. Um, anyway, it's hard to explain. It's just that it it, it takes you write it a certain way, and then you're editing it, and that becomes rewriting, and then you're working with music. And in this case, you know, we obviously had a lot of the score in mind uh, because it was it was uh, it was obviously the, the Strauss. Um, but but uh, it, it takes a while to edit. I, I still can't believe we shot this like the, this production was on like just over half a year ago uh, on stage. So we we moved pretty quickly to get it to this point. Yes. Uh, me. Great. Um, you mentioned uh, just now that uh, you do some rewriting in the editing, and I'm just wondering, uh, while you were cutting, was there, was there any changes from how the film was on the script or new directions you took? Yeah, well, were there changes as we were editing? Yes, um, there were. Uh, and the way the podcast worked, it was originally like one scene, but it felt very interesting to kind of weave it through a little bit. Obviously, the, uh, the, the flashbacks with the what was happening in the forest, uh, yeah, there were things that were shifting. Not as much as, let's say, the film like The Sweet Year After, which was completely reconstructed in the editing, but, but this one also, it, it, it's a final draft. And, and because you're working with voiceover, you're, you're rewriting it as well. Um, yeah. Sweet. I think we have time for a couple more questions. We'll go up here first. Well, like to be clear, the, there was the rehearsals for the opera in January. We opened the opera in February, and then we started shooting the film after the opera opened. So, so the opera rehearsals were over by the time we started making the film. But then there were certain things we had to kind of restage when we were filming the opera on those shooting days. But I. Um, the biggest leap was using these opera singers as, as actors as well. Like, so, so that was uh, at, at a rehearsal. Um, and, and, and by no means are they going to act operatically on, in film scenes, right? Um, and, and, and then on top of it, there are elements in the, in the domestic scenes of soap opera as well, right? So, they're, so you're trying to bring in these different kind of textures. Like it's like when she's watching, well, on the Zoom, and so she's always watching kind of the soap opera aspect of her own family, right? So, uh, so there's all these, like I said, it's all these different kind of tones, and it is just, you know, there are these displacements, right? Like that's what makes it disturbing as well. That things are not necessarily fitting the way you would want them, or, or and, the, and things are are slightly heightened. Like for instance, seeing her reflection on the computer the whole time, so she's in these scenes. Uh, like continuously, so that's 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 um, something that's done artificially, like you know, that's not a real reflection, but it, it, it creates that sense. And the sound, that it's not filtered sound, it's like it's clear sound, so they're right there. Uh, and there are moments where it's using, like sound becomes really important as well, like 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 how things are uh, placed sonically in terms of your apprehension. You know, the sounds of the rope, the creaking of the, the swing, and all that stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, it's all, it's all. But I, I work with an amazing team. And I've been working with this team for a very long time. So the collaboration between the composer and the sound designer, 
and, and the, the sound mixer, um, it goes back to the 80s when I started making films. It's the same, same group of people. So I've been really fortunate that way. Actually, the, the team generally is, is pretty much the same team. Yeah, we have time for one last question. I'm gonna let you pick the hand back. No pressure. <laughs> the hand, the last, the last question, this election goes to you. I feel like I should be blindfolded now. <laughs> <laughs> I should be like, and you should be asking me, talking to me about like, like sensing it. <laughs> how, how do we trip over the stage and, and take delight in that? And, yeah, it would be the cruel task, I don't know. Uh, uh, yes, in the middle, like I'm so, yes. That's the thing about a lot of these films. Like I've been in the screens where people are dead silent, and other ones where people find it, you know, amusing or funny, and that's totally okay. It, it is kind of out, it is it is outlandish, right? Like a lot of it is outlandish. It's like it's uh, like the way she's behaving. I, I wasn't. I had to go. The, the between like the like when she's when she's giving the directions, like like it's just. Like when she's running her hands in the hair and his reaction. <laughs> I, I hope that, that that is funny. Like that, that, that's a big laugh in that, in that scene. But, it, it, is it? Sorry. Well, you know, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you what. You sometimes with the music, you can indicate that something like uh, is meant to. Like the way I don't know if you noticed, but there are moments where there's music build up and it cuts. And it goes to silence. And that kind of creates kind of a, an effect where you you feel like again it's displaced. So you might you might find that funny or not, right? And and that's that's uh, um, so that's where the it, it's very easy to watch it with a group of people because because if someone laughs and people feel that they have permission to laugh, but it's not necessarily. Um, given to you explicitly. So some people might take it super seriously. Like someone was mentioning the, this film, The Adjuster, that I made, like I, which I think has a lot of dark humor. But I, I've also I've been to screenings where people are dead silent. So it, it, it's it's really I'm not I'm not saying it needs to be interpreted a certain way, right? It, it, it's really how you, you know, which makes it uncomfortable, right? As this person said, like it's not necessarily. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, again, thank you all so much. I tell you that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. 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 Thank